All right, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you are having a wonderful day. We have a very special interview today. We are here with Hugh Hendry, the acid capitalist. You have seen him on Bloomberg. You've watched him live on stream, and you guys even sent me some questions for him. However, we're I don't we're gonna get into a lot of different stuff here. Man, oh look at the guns too, baby. But it's gonna be an exciting one. It's a real blessing. So make sure you guys even show Hugh a lot of love after this. But I mean, there's a lot of places where we could start with this. So I don't know, Hugh. I kind of want to keep it a little bit light to start. I have a lot of questions about the yen. And I was even telling you before, if you guys didn't see that Bloomberg interview in September, Hugh actually called out the whole collateral thing. But I'm going to start with a, with a more fun question. Somebody sent me this one, Hugh, and I thought it was very interesting. So they said that in a previous interview, uh, you were talking about having your best creative ideas by not sitting at a terminal for 12 hours a day, but by being idle. So what can you offer advice for this area for anybody doing anything trading, investing wise? I think we'll start there and then we're going to get into the yen. <laughs> yeah, great. Well, first of all, Josh, wonderful, uh, wonderful to, to, to share the, the, the time and space with you. Um, the question is good. Um, I, um, I did my utmost not to be the suit um, and not to conform. Um, I'm kind of on a mission that we live in this awful space where finance is it's just dull. Uh, it's just black energy. Um, and it doesn't have to be that. You know, this, this perceived orthodoxy is, is simply that. It's a perception. It doesn't have to be your reality. Um, we're talking about time travel. We're talking about having the audacity to see the future. And so I try and play games and I try and create neuroplasticity um, from getting distance, from doing other things. I mean, we're constantly processing information. I mean, one of the things for me, um, I, I can't read. I mean, I can read sometimes, <laughs> but um, the, the format of a physical book no longer works for me because I need the Kindle. You know, and, and why? Um, when I'm reading, there are, there are phrases, there are sentences, and they will elicit a response in my mind. I've got so much traffic passing through, and I'm trying to, you know, I'm trying to work it out constantly in St. Bart's, surfing, doing yoga, whatever. And there's something about just a well-phrased sentence or, or some conjecture, and boom, it just all comes together. And so I like I need to be able to capture that, you know, screen grab it. The, the, here I am uh, advertising Kindle, but, you know, <laughs> grabbing it and bringing it in. Um, and that really works for me. Um, I think that that comment, the question stems from, I can remember stacking hay in a barn in the English countryside. And I, I began to see the evolution of a currency trade um, I think maybe long the South African run. This was this is going back like twelve years. Yeah, ago. I was going to so, say, when yeah, was this? Like, when did you realize yeah. this? When did this desire to like, I guess, get outside of the traditional way? Because everyone thinks. I mean, I wake up early, but I don't really do things the normal way. But a lot of people think you gotta, you know, books, 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 read, read, read. If you're not getting all this information, if you don't know the charts, you'll never make money. Like, like was this twelve years ago? You realized this. Um, so the, the first thing it is a passion. Um, so, you know, I was a I was a grown up adult. Um, if we go back a long time, 30 years ago, and I was you know, I was reading the the Jack Schwager interviews you know, with market traders and stuff, literally under the duvet with a torch, like as a boy's own adventure. And and I've interviewed and hired a, a ton of young kids. And you got to have that prerequisite passion has got to be oozing out of you you know passion Amen. is 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 the thing that makes it happen and so yeah i i read it all um but that was formative and then it's stored and then we have to do other things i was fortunate i met a kind of uh, a cranky kind of genius guy in london and he said to me hey look the, the challenge here is playfulness is curiosity um and for me again um uh, music, I was going to say pop music, I'm not really pop music, but music. So I would, 
I spent a lot of time at, at home. I, I wasn't good in offices because I had loud music on. I'm a kind of got to move. And then I, I, I created with the Bloomberg, you can download an index. And then I had my chart configuration. And I could load in four or 500 stops. And I'd get like 30 second blasts. I called it chart pornography. Um, <laughs> and I was just looking for I, you know, my, my mind, you know, like, well, like pornography. What is that, that? That great judgment. You know, it's hard to define, but my God, we know it when we see it. And, and so I had all of this moving wallpaper. Um, and then and, and the backdrop would be Pink Floyd or whatever, you know, um, and and ideas would come. Um, and, and with those ideas, I would then come back into a conventional world. I, I had an intelligence operation. I had really, really smart kids working with me. And, I, and I'd say, Liz, I don't know. I'm, I'm crazy, but I kind of want to do this. Why? I think this is why I want to do it. I could always conceive of a, nar of, of a macro narrative that would kind of explain what I was doing. But I was like, you know, you go out, test and come back push me push me push me back so through all of that we created a synthesis and we created an eclectic portfolio interesting so it was knowledge obtained and living life helped bring it out essentially so it's kind of a mix of both yeah yeah a bit but a, a rich life and, and yeah, i'm trying to show that you know on my instagram stream and, and everything else the, these short stories I'm, I'm i am constantly moving you know, i'm kind of for the last six weeks, I've been traveling back and forward from West Hollywood, Venice Beach, London, Paris, Scotland, and there are things happening. I'm seeing people, but you know, at the same time, all of this traffic is coming through and it's being processed, and I'm getting a better understanding of things. Yeah, and, and you have a deep understanding. That's the thing, though. I think even, so it seems like you live in life, you're enjoying it, and that's helping you bring it out. But now, even now to your understanding, like I feel like you have a grasp of the markets and a lot of things going on way better than most. I mean, even then, I guess part of your claim to fame is your performance during 2008, correct? Didn't, didn't you have like people were getting mad at you because you did so good and you were just on top of it and even relates to some of the stuff we got going on now, but it's, it's like a deep, deep understanding. You do hold those still, right? Yeah. I mean, people just, they don't like it when unorthodox approaches come to the fore Amen. And, and make a mockery <laughs> of the others you know I, I can recall back um with the if you know god if we go back almost 25 years you know the nasdaq bubble um like with the chart formation you know like it, it, keeping it simple and, and again without um you know people have all these isms you know socialism etc and, and they become tribal um trying to be loose you know, I bought things going up without prejudice. And I sold things going down without prejudice. And at that great time, things were going up uh, and people had prejudice and they were shorting or they were avoiding it and they were being killed. You saw that with Tesla. I mean, the number of people who got killed with the, the almighty rise and rise of Tesla, smart, smart folk, people who actually saw that phenomenon 25 years ago, but they still had this urge to fight it. You know, for me, I you know, I'm simple. I, I'll buy things going up and I'll, I'll sell things going down or I'll do nothing. You know, those are my, my states of being. So how would you um, apply then, that you know, to now, though? So now let's take well, it even now this market. How would you how would you feel about things going on now, buying and selling without prejudice? How do you how do you think people are nowadays, even yourself? Um. So, I mean, right now, I mean, my message all of this year um, is to, you know, there's a provocative beginning. You know, this market's easy. That's provocative. You know? <laughs> no, the markets are, never, markets are never easy, but, you know, this market's easy. You avoid stocks and, and you own the ultra long end of the treasury market through like an ETF such as the TLT, the tilts. You got uh -huh. to tilt into this market. But that's, that's been, been my message. Um, now that, if there are wise seasoned listeners and watchers, they'll be going, Hold on, hold, hold on just a second. What? <laughs> WTF? Because um, I'm actually contradicting myself because um, the, the, the tilts have been trending and they've been trending down. Um, so what happened, what happened to my kind of simple loose approach? Um, so like everything, it, you, you, you graft on elements to it. Um, 
experience. And there's a, there's a wonder and a joy of something that happens in the financial universe, which is um, mean reversion. Uh, now, mean reversion, mm-hmm. when, it, when it occurs to individual kind of stock positions and the like, is really, really not so appealing because there's so much idiosyncratic kind of stuff that comes along with that. What I'm talking about is mean reversion in a macro universe where there's like, you know, if there's four cardinal points in a compass or whatever, there's kind of, there's the gold price, there's the treasury bond price, there's the dollar price, and there's the S&P. You know, there's my compass, okay? And when I see mean reversion in those four compass points, I get I get intrigued. I, th- I think we live in a, a macro world where mean reversion in those huge macro assets becomes a profit opportunity to lean into. So I think the TLT, or the ultra-long treasuries, has mean I mean, it has. It's mean reverted. Yeah. I mean, we've in terms of if we ignore the income, which is a considerable kind of let's just ignore something considerable. Uh, but if we just look at the price component of treasuries, we've wiped out over 20 years of price performance. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and again, simple. I, I like 20 and four. What am I saying? Uh, two, like really long moving averages. What I use? Uh, tw- what are these? Um, 200, 200 day moving average no no 200 months 200 months uh, oh 200 you know months. i actually saw that recently i think even the hong kong index was re- it was hitting like the 300 month moving average or something like that recently yeah like, mm-hmm. yeah um and and that's so the um i'm i you know like you've wiped put 20 years of gains um, from a macro perspective, I know two things. Um, I know that the economy is just not working. It's, it's kind of illusionary. Yeah, yeah we, 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 we add on GDP, but it's at the expense of mounting um, uh, levels of, of debt. Um, for the or- ordinary people, uh, per capita GDP just is growing at its slowest and most disappointing level. I want to say kind of ever, like ever since we invented like modern economics, ever in the period of, let's say, 150 years. And then I know that we have this um, this form of regulating the behavior of, of trading continents, the US, China, Europe, mm-hmm. Latin America. Um, and it's being gamed by a group of countries called mercantilists who um, are pursuing a beggar thy neighbor. It's, it's a It's a... It's a cruel spectator sport. It's awful to see. You know, on the one hand, I'm saying to you, ordinary folk are, are just not participating in other people's prosperity. Um, and I'm laying the responsibility at this really strange thing. What is a strange thing in economics? We have countries which year after year after year are generating surplus trade balances, predominantly with America. And I've got to tell you, economics was never conceived to operate that ma- in that manner. Economics was conceived in terms of creating a disequilibrium which would generate the forces which would pull you back. Mm-hmm. Um, and those forces are being held in abeyance by policies such as the undervaluation of the of the Chinese remember, but essentially by the impoverishment of the household sector in places like Germany, China, Japan, et al. Um, and in doing so, they're transferring a lot of what should be the wealth of the household sector. And it's coming into um, capital flows, which is essentially the purchase of treasuries. And they're bringing all this capital. The, the, all of the world's free capital is being dumped predominantly in the US and secondary in the UK. Why? Because they're open and liberal economies. Um, You can, no one protests about you putting the money in and you can pull it out. Um, And so we've got that another strange phenomenon, which is in the US, it doesn't need the capital. It doesn't need it to fund investment. Domestic investment uh, needs or the demand for are actually historically, they're kind of muted and low and they're absolutely accommodated for by domestic savings and yet all of the rest of the world's savings are coming into the US and being dumped. Now when that happens we're dropping kind of Mount Everest into this lake and it's creating this tsunami of liquidity which is creating inflation in financial assets. 
yeah and it's making you know all the guys who panhandle handle equities um, <laughs> rich rich <laughs> the but equity it's panhandlers yeah i'll even ask you this i think it's a great segue because you're talking about everything with the world all these countries again just like the imbalance with all these different countries how do you feel about this thing going on? Because everybody keeps asking me this. I have this debate on the daily now. What do you think about the de-dollarization and the BRICS? Is that a threat? Is it, How does that even play into what you just said about the other impoverished nations and even dumping the, the surplus into all of our financial assets? How, what, what do you think about it? Um, it is complete and utter bullshit. Um, <laughs> um, it, and it, you know, it reflects a profound ignorance on the on the nature of economics and and money. Um, you know, I, one of my slogans is "There's only five people who yes. understand." Yes, we want to know who. Money. We want to know who Hugh. We want to know who those. Give us one person. Just give. We know one of them. I think it might be you because you said they surf, they got long hair, and they don't wear suits. So I don't know. Can we get a name? I know you are. You you took an oath of secrecy, but. Indeed, well, I, I, I certainly am, am acutely aware of their work, and it's very much the, the forefront of how I, I think and operate. But I would have to defer. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, but let me tell you, there, there are two people that I hold in profound esteem. Um, there is a professor of economics at Peking University, uh, Michael Pettis. Michael um, Pettis. And he's collaborated with Matthew Klein, and they. Uh, put out a book called uh, Trade Wars. I think Trade Wars are class wars. And I think of Michael as being a modern Keynes. And before some of you start going, oh, Keynes and Keynesianism, <laughs> you know, be, again, be quiet. You're just swallowing propaganda and prejudice is no place on this platform where we're trying to execute best ideas. Amen. Okay. Um, so so Michael is, is a great source an inspiration for me um, and then you know I am I sometimes I feel like I'm just John the Baptist with Jeff Snyder over at the Eurodollar University um, you know you mentioned collateral you know, Jeff is the collateral king and and the work that he has pursued with his kind of university program on YouTube um, it's tough it's a real deep dive into an arcane world um, and I'm trying to facilitate and and and, and share my understanding. So I take Jeff's kind of thinking of money and I, I, Chris, I, I, I process it through me and then I send it towards, you know, to, to you guys. Um, what so do you the, the, this, this question about the de-dollarization, right? I mean, it's, yeah. it's, 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 it's nonsense, right? Why is it nonsense? It's nonsense because I said to you that we have these persistent, trade surpluses. China operates on the basis that its GDP can only expand um, as it pursues more and more uh, share of the world's industrial activity. And, and so it's kind of insisting on a high savings model so that it can build more and more infrastructure. And the infrastructure is really kind of like creating a moat, a protective uh, deflector around these uh, huge uh, metropolises of international trade, these excellent centers. Um, the productivity of the Chinese is uh, all right. It's really just, it's the stacking of this uh, insanely dope, amazing infrastructure um, and, and that it's so plugged in that, that it works. Um, but that model, the, the cash, the flow of funds that comes to China, so ordinarily, that should enrich Chinese citizens. They should feel wealthier vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world. How that happens is that the Chinese renminbi or the yuan would be stronger. You know, if you think of uh, Europe in the 1970s, the currencies like were like space rockets versus the U.S. dollar. Like Germans became really, really rich vis-a-vis mm -hmm. -vis the rest of the world. You know, they could buy American uh, manufactured products, and it was it was less and less when they paid for it in Deutschmarks. And so they would buy more. And as they bought more, they would be creating American jobs. That whole process should be happening in China. But it's not because they take the dollars coming in and they push it straight back to America and they buy treasuries. Mm. So the de-dollarization could only happen if countries such as China 
were willing to allow their currencies to appreciate. The Chinese currency today, I want to say, is about 690. You require 6.91 to buy one US dollar. And then they freak out let if it goes tell- above seven. <laughs> yeah, let me tell you that 30 years ago, like, so 1994, uh, uh, when we had the, the initial NAFTA economic agreement between Canada, the US, and Mexico, the Chinese devalued um, and it settled around 8.5. So that's a long, that's like almost 30 years ago, 8.5, and today it's 6.9, which is to say it did require 8.51 to buy a dollar, today it's 6.9. So the one has increased in value, those Chinese citizens are modestly richer. But I, I want to say to you that in economics, it should be trading at four, that those Chinese citizens should be doptastically much richer, and therefore their demand for exports from the US should be huge. And that's how we we would escape this conundrum of the world has too much savings and not enough demand. And therefore, everyone ends up stacking boxes at, at Amazon. Yeah. So mm-hmm. China would have to give up on its trade policy. The, the, the dollar is, abs- is paramount to the success of the Chinese, and unfortunately, the success of the Chinese, you know, and indeed the other mercantilist nations, um, is at the expense of the U.S. household sector. There's only two two groups who participate and profit from this environment, and that is the the kind of autocrats who run the Chinese system. You know, they're in office forever, and it's 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 Wall Street. Anyone who is close to the money um, gets richer. But as they get yeah. richer, they spend less and less of their income. And everyone else is left with maxing out their credit card. Um, so de-dollarization actually would be a wonderful thing. Um, every, you could say, 70 years or so, you kind of get cracks, you know. Um, the, 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 the gaming and the cheating become so obscene that the whole system blows. That's what happened at the end of the 1920s. And something impossible happened Um, and that's again get distance get creative so that you can have a sense and you can have the courage to 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 conceive of the impossible the impossible back then was the british government rejected the gold standard they came off the gold standard i mean it was impossible like no one could conceive of that (laughs) and yet it happened and so i think if there's going to be a de-dollarization it's not going to because It's not going to be because China and Saudi Arabia are like exchanging oil for Remimbi. It's not going to be because Lulu and Lululand in Brazil is trying to encourage (laughs) more wine to Saudi Brazil. No, it's going to be because Americans give it the finger and they say, no, this thing's over. We're not going to tolerate that. And that's what I see. I told everybody who's told me this, I've said, I was like, listen, I'll believe it. Once you stop taking dollars for anything, if the minute you let me pay you in a ruble or a, a yuan, I got you on that. Great. I love that, though. I love yeah, that well, thinking. Stick, stick it to the man, okay? Because it's not difficult, right? You know what you do? You, you just, you see, we're going to pursue the same policy as you. We're going to make it remarkably hard for you to transfer all of this capital into our country. We don't need it. The only people who need it are the people who are profiting from higher and higher asset prices. But that's to the impoverishment of everyone else. I mean, that's kind of the energy behind Trump. Trump's not the person to deliver it, right? Um, the hope is there's going to be a fool on a fool's journey with his little pack on his shoulder, and he can communicate, and he can understand economics, and he can say, folks, you've been sold lies, okay? What we got to do here is we got to put up like taxes on all this transfer of money coming in, we're going to make it really impossibly hard for other countries to dump capital into our markets because they are, they're making what was once a great entrepreneurial society into a speculative society where, you know, look at us. I mean, we should be doing something more constructive, right? And instead yeah. <laughs> we're speculating in the price of bonds and, and, and stocks and the gold price. So because you, we have to. So you think corruption or even just general policy would is probably the biggest thing 
affecting us right now then i don't know that's the that's what i'm kind of picking up on i don't like i don't like those words i would say um it, it i th- i think it's just the the theory of cock up i think you've got mostly well meaning public servants um and they just blunder through the system because yeah. it's a complicated system. And actually, it's the advisors. They, they're not getting good advice. And why? Because the advisors are all hooked to Wall Street onto the drip of becoming richer and richer at the expense of everyone else. Wow. You know, the Fed. It's easy to slam the Fed. Problem with the you know, Look at Jay Powell, right? I mean, um, I don't agree with his policies. I don't agree with a lot of the things he does. But... Is is he corrupt? No. Yeah, I agree. He's is, not. I I agree hundred percent. I think he's not. Uh, no. I've heard people tell me it's shady. I say I don't think so. I think he's he he may have not done the best job, but he's he seems like a pretty genuine, straightforward individual. Yeah, I mean, why anyone would want the job that man did? <laughs> I mean, you know. No. However, is Jay like one of the leading great lights? in economic clarity does this guy under does he really understand money was he was he hired because of his profound intellect in the understanding of money <laughs> the answer is no no yeah he's, no. that's what that's what we just even like we even realized it like low key jerome powell's been kind of a career politician i know he worked at carlisle he had a history doing investment stuff he's a lawyer uh but you know, he's been in government since the 90s. I mean, he was even helping Buffett and Solomon Brothers and all of that. So it's a very, very interesting yeah. point right there. I mean, let's let's turn it on its head. Oh, not on its head, but just to accentuate that, um, you know, Credit Suisse <laughs> is no longer in the land of the living, okay? Um, it effectively failed, okay? However, if you look at every very, very tight regulatory control and demands placed on that bank because it was deemed to be a too big to fail institution. It was absolutely scrutinized to the you know, finite detail. And it met absolutely every metric of stability and robustness. And yet it failed that. And again, I'm paraphrasing Jeff Snyder here, but that just exposes this fallacy that they understand money they don't i agree <laughs> i agree i agree 100 percent. now let me let me ask you this let's take it back a little bit like even looking at society and and i like what you said where most people are like genuine well you know they mean well how would you compare like the money developments in the economy and even how people and the trade balances how would you compare this to to japan in like between like the 70s and the 90s and last time where we started raising, you know, we had low rates and everyone would go, all the hot money goes to Japan. Then they pull out right when we start raising again. Was it similar back then? Would you say the culture is similar um, or no? The, there is an argument um, that we've had f- essentially four iterations of the same thing. Um, and China being the fourth and most current iteration of the rest. Of, we we all s- want to believe in God. We all are looking for um, idolatry. We want to we want to worship something, you know. And 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 countries are no different. And so we worshipped Japan and its what was perceived to be its economic model because year after year after year they just got their stocks went up um, they made like funky things people wanted to buy it they operated trade surpluses and people in their head believe that's a good thing and and we started examining their culture we had all these kind of we went we looked at their industrial process and you had these japanese names like kanban and it was how they were organizing production um and all it was, again, was a form of mercantilism and an out-of-control expansion in credit within Japan, um, which exaggerated things. So what I want to say about that, think about GDP. GDP is the, the total sum of, of spending in the economy. Um, or, and, of course, 
if it's the total of, of spending, then it's the total of all the output of goods produced and services uh, produced in the economy. Um, and we handicap that figure uh, and we talk about nominal and then we handicap it with inflation and we say, well, okay, nominal was five, but inflation was running at three. And so real GDP is two. Okay. Now, I've never understood why we, we stopped at that point. I, I think we'd be better served if we handicapped again and we said, well, hold on a second. Actually, over the course of this calendar year, the, the, the total debt in the economy rose 10 percentage points versus GDP. You know, and so actually the growth rate that you're seeing in GDP has been inflated by the debt. And don't we kind of want to compare countries pari passu? So we want to take out the, the idiosyncratic either increase or decrease in national debt to actually get an, an impression of the underlying expansion in income that year from you know the productive allocation of people's time and effort. We don't do that. And so Japan was an example of debt was going up. Um, people had this idolatry. They thought it was low risk that Japanese people were different. And they wanted to lend to them. And at some point, Japan got too much debt. Asset prices began to fall. Um, and we discovered that the Japanese were just like us. You know, <laughs> they, they, got, they got some good things right and they made some really really dumb decisions now before japan and um, it was brazil brazil was like this like dope place i had you know like cool place to go big country lots of natural resources and uh, they were investing in infrastructure and they were growing you know but they were no different and before brazil would you believe it was russia you know like there was a time when the west was absolutely absolutely convinced that you know the Russian communist system was the way to expand GDP. I mean, China is simply the the latest iteration of idolatry, which I would say is misplaced. And if we had that additional calibration of debt to GDP and we took it out of the equation, we handicapped all countries. I think we'd get more clarity, albeit one could say at this point in the universe, in the financial universe, I don't think there is a country where debt to GDP is not expanding. Yeah. So. And so it seems like credit and debt is like a big thing. Like, I feel like you're not really as convinced about like, OK, yeah, you make money. Yeah, you have GDP. You're kind of more like, give me the net net. Like, where did it really come from? And then the debt. And then again, tying this back now into the politics. But like, how did Japan, how did they go? How did they gain so much debt? Was that because of their politicians not being guided well? Was it because the demand was there? How did they get to that point, essentially? Well, I mean, money is a belief system. Mm. Okay. And so um, if you get your propaganda <laughs> on point, right, then you, you create a cult. And the cult is such that you want to be a participant and the cost of membership is extending credit, is making loans. And everyone wants to make loans. You know, like um, China was probably peak cult in um, kind of like going through COVID in the sense that what happened, their their trade surplus just exploded. We were all, all on our ass. They seemed to like be able to control. Remember when we thought they could control the pandemic um, and, and they were just booming. And I think the year 2021, the institutional allocation of, of money, of investment flows into China was at its highest ever. Right. Yeah. And, and now people just they, they just can't wait to get money out. I mean, we just get and that. But then sucked. but that's where like it looked like that. And then the then the politicians came in. I mean, Xi Jinping's crackdown and all of that. So, I mean, if China, let's say, would be that fourth iteration, would the way they have control of everything, would that possibly be the thing that maybe makes it where they don't repeat what everybody has done? I mean, can excessive control protect you from falling into this mercantile trap well the the control that you th this is good because it's it, it's reinforced i believe it's reinforcing because it goes back to the de-dollarization i i want to say to you that the chinese yuan will never replicate uh, 
the success of the US dollar. It won't be a reserve currency for the very reason that the controls that they apply to the flow of money in and out of China will never make it an acceptable reserve currency. So uh -huh. um, the Chinese, indeed the, the world today, I think is horribly disfigured owing to the Asian tiger crisis at the at the end of the 19, how was the, the 19, in the 1990s, uh, you know, Thailand, I think, Thailand's GDP expanded at something close to 20% per annum for 20 years. It was uh, all of them. It was and, them, Malaysia, and then and it started with Japan. And then right when we raised rates, everything just went whoosh right out. Yeah. So if you look at that period, so that's the, um, there was a 20 year period of massive economic expansion out of um, Southeast Asia. If you go back 20 years from that data point, that takes you into the 70s. In the 1970s, um, the cognoscenti thought Asia was a, a, was laughing stock. It was just <laughs> like the people were kind of different culturally. They just weren't switched on. You know, we invent, uh, we have fallacies when we create these narratives. Um, in the 1970s, like I say, like the, 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 the country that they lusted after was Brazil, right? Kind of, you know, the financial community fell over themselves investing in in South America. Right? That, that's where the growth was. And, and what happened at, um, when Volcker was raising interest rates, um, South America just blew up. They had too much debt. The, the, the money was invested poorly. And therefore, when rates hit a point, you know, uh, South America just went down, collapsed. And so and people are like, oh. And so then the money switched into Southeast Asia. And then when money starts coming in, um, because the economies had been starved of capital, there was lots of productive and profitable investments. And so suddenly you got 20 year cycle, which culminated in like mean, mean extension, mean, mean, you know, the price has been too far away from reality. And so we had that crisis and that crisis was prompted by international investors pulling the money out, capital flow saying, ah, I've changed my mind. Okay. And the lesson to the Chinese was, oh my God, you know, George Soros, you know, like, I mean, how people, I mean, why are people so scared of George Soros? It's just like, again, idolatry, and then we, we, we need to be scared of some bogeyman. It's all an invention. Like, invest without prejudice, people. Amen. But anyway, the Chinese looked at that and they said, we will never allow unfettered capital access into our country because the only thing that we, uh, we need is we need to be the Chinese Communist Party forever. And so we can't be vulnerable to the vicissitudes of capital flows. That was the seed origin um, of markets being where they are today. Like markets in the world have just gone like that because China is not allowed that unfettered access. And the more money tried to come into China via trade flows and, and speculative flows, China channeled it and pushed it right back into the US and pushed stocks and property prices and everything to the sky. And now we have a generation of people that can't afford anything. You can't afford to, you know, like, come, you can't afford a university education. If you get one, you can't afford, you know, an apartment in a major metropolis, et cetera, et cetera. So, we, it so we're in, inheriting it then, it. essentially. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, but, you know. So let me ask you this, though, then. With all of this now, we've got to even go through a little bit of history in different countries. Now, let's talk about right now. So why haven't we had that happen yet? How come we, we see banking collapse? I mean, we just even had the, we had Evergrande. Now, I know that was Asia, but even now it's like, because the question everyone's asking, I, I see a lot of people get frustrated. <laughs> and I tell them to calm down. I'm like, you know, markets take time. Don't underestimate the resiliency. But it's like, how come we have, what, five times de debt to GDP right now? You, we, we have a lot of the similar setup. How come the same shocks that would have, you know, made people leave? How come we're not seeing that now? And I mean, I guess what makes what, what, what makes us so special, especially with all of the other problems that we possess? Um, well, that, those are, in terms of the uh, American financial assets, why are American financial assets so so? Why so won't special? it go down <laughs> no matter what happens? How come it never goes down? Um, well, it does. 
And so, you know, you know, government treasury bond prices were actually the greatest bull market of the last 30 years. And I say greatest. Um, if you measure how much they've gone up versus the, the price volatility, they, they've gone up typically without without jarring you. It's been a very smooth progression higher and higher, um, which has meant that you could own more of them. You know, if, if Bit, Bitcoin, you know, Bitcoin um, had a volatility of 50. How much could you, okay, you're bullish, but how much of your wealth could you really park in an asset which was like boom, 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 you know? I mean, it's gone from, what, 67,000 and it hit like 18 something. Um, and maybe it's going to hit eight something and then maybe it's going to hit 120,000. I mean, like your allocation there is going to be kind of small, whereas your treasury is historically just going do, 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 do. And so your allocation would be very high. So you think our um, bond market those, is what has given us the stability then? Um, or is that our extra layer of I'm armor? Saying, I'm saying the bond market has has been sta stable, but it's been stable for for reasons which are not fantastic. Again, they've been it's been stable because inflation has been falling. And I you know, I know this is past tense. I know that we live in a world where prices have become very elevated in the last two years. But since 1980, inflation across the yeah, world has fallen. And, but I would attribute that to beg of thy neighbor policies. I'd like China and mercantilist nations um, expand and prosper at the expense of uh, the household sector in the West. Okay. Um, so that's why bond prices, I think, have been so high. But to your point, things never go down. Well, you, I'm saying to you, you've wiped out like almost 25 years of price appreciation in U.S. Treasuries, mm. so they do happen. Two thousand and eight did happen. Your know, Bitcoin has fallen from sixty-seven thousand to eighteen thousand, and then if you go into the stock market, if you look at the S and P five hundred, you will find plenty of well-known household names which are trading at the same nominal price as they traded twenty years ago. Yeah, you know? it's there, but it's kind of disguised because you have stocks like. You know, Google and Microsoft and the Teslas of this world. And as they get bigger and bigger, they kind of, if you will, distort the picture. Yeah. Um, and so that re that remains a clear and present danger. And then you know, where we are just now is you've had um, like the greatest uh, financial tightening of, of conditions. Um, and like I've been warning, you're going to break things. So you, again, you've got well-meaning public servants who don't, don't understand money. It's a bit like if you've seen the serialization of the drama which led to um, the nuclear power plant blowing up in Chernobyl. I mean, these oh. guys are sitting. <laughs> they've, they've got a, a control panel and they're like, I like, like that. That's a, that's a great visual to think of. I've never, I've never compared the Fed to Chernobyl, but I, I see it. Yeah, but imagine there's a big red button that's called higher interest rates <laughs> and you're sitting in the nuclear power station is the fact that i must correct you we're not five times debt to gdp if we were to approximate to the nearest whole number it would be four times but, you know um but we've got four times debt to gdp which is four times greater than it was 40 years ago right so it's you know that's the that's the that's the nuclear energy and that's what's pushed asset prices up etc but if you mess with it if you press that red button in the Chernobyl power station, this this baby's gonna blow. This, you're gonna blow the whole damn thing up. And I've been like, Jay, please, no, guys, don't <laughs> don't do this, right? And, and, and what are we seeing? We we we've seen people getting people getting worried. You know, <laughs> like regional banks. Regional banks are really really important lifeblood of the United States economy, and like no one wants to touch them, right? We've just seen Credit Suisse, one of the most strategically significant banks in the world, and it doesn't exist anymore. And yet, if you were looking at the control panel in Chernobyl, they're like, "Hey, look, you know, these the, the capital ratios good. You know, if we look at the the Basel three things, everything is compliant." But boom, <laughs> okay, why? You know, the, there's a famous phrase from the former West German Chancellor. Um, in the late 1970s, and remember the Fed went to 20% interest rates, and he said interest rates are the highest ever since Jesus Christ walked on the <laughs> earth. Right? I want to say to you, interest rates are higher now. They're they're higher because whilst they're five and not 20, 
if you multiply the five by four, which is the debt to GDP, yeah. we're at the level where this, I mean, you know, I'm in the power station and I'm getting sweaty, so the like, steam coming out, the things vibrating, boom. But then, so will that be the instance then where we actually see things come down then where it's not like, pretty much can Google hide from that or no? Is that is, is that where you see that next level? Um. That, that's the next level. So, you know, again, what happens? Remember, we've mentioned this awful pandemic um, and we don't have a lot of data points. You know, we, we knew that there was a, a devastating pandemic um, after the Second World War and it killed, I don't know, one or two percent of the global population. It was, you know, terrifying. And so there was a moment where you're thinking, you know, GDP could just collapse, you know, 10, 20 percent. Um, and of course it didn't, but suddenly amidst all this great fear there were companies and their profits went up netflix and google and <clears throat> and apple of course and people are like holy shit like yeah. these, these businesses are riskless right we've just had this alien body snatching invasion <laughs> we're all doomed <laughs> and and profits are going higher and higher like people are buying more and more <laughs> iphones and they're on Zoom and they're watching more Netflix. And it, literally, when you convince yourself that something is riskless, there is no upper limit to the price that you are willing to pay for it. It becomes like a, a Medigliani, a Picasso. It becomes a piece of art. Like people wow. just pay anything. So, that, and that's where we were. Um, do you think that could but, maintain this time around then? Will it? Will we see no. that if credit gets messed up? Will will people still be paying? Because we still haven't seen people cancel Netflix, even when the stock dropped too. It's so it's like, do yeah. will that happen again? Well, I mean, but it, they did. They, they their order, the momentum in the flow. Yeah, it's not um, like 2015. They're not. It's not the yeah, same. Net, you know, Netflix are looking at different remuneration models. They were thinking about like putting advertising through the thing. Um, domestic U.S. growth has moderated international is not as strong you know yeah and um, but i want to say i let's be provocative why not i think um the fed raising the cost of debt in a world which is drowning in debt is actually scarier than a pandemic i think has the mm. ability to to really hold the economy more uh, than the, the than the pandemic um and, and time will will tell i mean the problem in the problem is not knowing what's going to happen, not knowing the destination, the outcome. The problem is surviving until enough people have worked it out. Um, I knew in early 2007, well, I didn't know that Lehman was, was going to go bankrupt. I didn't know particular names, but I knew that the system was acutely vulnerable and could just go like Chernobyl, boom, okay? And there was, you know, it was like just cranky, weird people. You've seen the movie, The the Big Short. I mean, you know, they made a movie out of it because the people were kind of funky. You know, they were kind of like, you know, they're not suits. Um, let's say there's like 50 or 150 people in the world that knew about it. So the world's going to blow up. And Elon's got a rocket going to Mars. I'm like, I got to get on that rocket. And then let's go into... Um, Charlie in the chocolate. Let's just throw every metaphor at this thing. You know, if you read Charlie in the chocolate factory, <laughs> you got the, the, the poor kid Charlie. And but if you if you're one of the lucky ones and you buy the chocolate bar and it's got the gold wrap and you've got the invitation, then you get to go on Elon's Musk, Musk's <laughs> rocket, and you get to you get to be one of the ones that survive the catastrophe, right? Um, and I had that damn ticket. And then what happened was um, I have a I had a custodian bank, so I had the trade you know, in, in the uh, in the in the mortgage securities. I was short. I was buying protection, etc. And and then my the overseeing uh, custodian bank said, "You got to sell." I'm like, "What?" Like the, you know, it's like I'm walking onto the spaceship, and they're like, "No, I'm sorry, your ticket's no good." I'm like, "Wait, why? Why they tell you have to sell?" Because um, they were damn stupid. Um, the the saner answer is that the securities that I was buying were a new invention. Mm. You know, they hadn't been around. And the custodian's responsibility was to verify my net asset value and therefore to, to make a market in my hedge fund. And their point was, we, 
and I, I bought a lot. I mean, I really <laughs> bought a lot of you know Charlie chocolate, Charlie's chocolate. If you will. <laughs> Charlie, I chocolate. really bought. I bought a lot of Charlie's chocolate, and and they're like, yeah, yeah, we, you know, no, I, we can't make a market. So I was like, merd, and I had to then, I had to then buy more chocolate. I had to conceive of another way of doing it. But anyway, so uh, I did get safe passage, but. They kept they kept me in the airport, if you will, in the terminal, yeah. until the thing was just about to go. I mean, so I had, I had fifteen months of hell of knowing what was going to happen, but no one else knew. And they were, you know, oil went to one hundred and fifty bucks because the future was so bright. The ECB raised interest rates a because they're idiots, uh -huh. b because they thought the future was so bright. Um, and every time the Federal Reserve was cutting interest rates from September 2007. Every time the Fed cut interest rates, um, the back end of the bond market was raising future expectations because like the future is so bright. And I'm like, would, why is everyone crazy? And then of course, right at the very last minute that, you know, in October, it, it just blew up. I made 50% and, and gained some notoriety. Or, or, that's you know, hon honestly, that's why I'm- the journey. I'm surprised that you do not get as much notoriety as like Michael Burry because you went through the same thing you were and that's and, and even then to the point now I've, I've been telling people now like yeah you you got to make it till the end so like would you say surviving up until the moment is harder than actually reacting in the moment um, I would say to you that surviving is actually a, a, a harder operation than actually conceiving the destination. It's kind of easy to, to conceive of what's going to happen. You know, again, if you can kind of get your mind to be loose and to kind of try and see around corners, um, you know, it, it's, it's feasible. Um, you know, one of my favorite books, which I, um, you know, we, we spoke about how uh, fiction can unlock, can be the key that allows, you know, the successful uh, processing of the mental traffic. And there's a book by John uh, Buchan uh, Buchanan, a Scottish writer. Uh, and it's just a little short story and it's, it's about nothing, you know, it's, but it, it has a, a German professor who believes that he can train the mind to see the future. And, and there's a there's a dinner party and he, and he takes three hosts, uh, three, three uh, invites at the parties. And one of them's a banker and he trains his mind to, to read the front page of the Wall Street Journal in one year's time. And so he's seen the future and the, and the stories and the book is all about forewarned with what's going to happen, what actually happens. And that's the, you know, that's when markets get, that's when markets get. I funky. like it. You, I like it. I want to read that. Yeah. Um, and, and we'll, or, or read the Bible. I do. You know, oh, like, dude, you are, that's a, that's a big thing. I read, I've, I say Proverbs. <laughs> I say Proverbs is the best business book ever written. A lot of people don't realize yeah. it. Hundred percent. It it's it's the, it's the best guide to investing. You know, Jesus, he he's the Almighty. Uh huh. And and he knows that over the weekend he's going to be crucified. I mean, he's like, oh, you know, why you why why do you need wow. to crucify me? But you know, he's like, oh, bugger. And he says to his disciples, he's like, guys, he, he hands them the bread, like, and they're like, know? they're like, he ain't gonna die. Nah, he ain't. <laughs> Wow. Well, he, he looks at Peter and Paul, you know, the guys who wrote these 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 great books, and he says, "Guys, you're going to reject me." No, reject <laughs> you, God? I I can't reject God. He's like, "Look, it's going to happen. I'm I've seen it. Like impossible." Uh, and of course, we know that when the guards come to to get him, I think he's he's in the bushes doing a wee or something, and and so the guards don't see him, and they're like, "We're here for him, you know, for Jesus, you know, the guy with the hair, those kind of funky boots, <laughs> you know, he does miracles," and they're like, "You never heard of him, you know? Caught crows one time, caught crows two uh, times, caught crows three times, and they keep rejecting. They've seen the future, and they reject. Dude, my How mind many is, of us? My people? mind is blown. I've I've read a lot of the Bible, but connecting that to the the whole concept of you could know what happens and then how, it, oh my gosh, that's, that's amazing. Uh, that's amazing. So I'll, let me ask you this now, this time around. Yeah. It feels, I feel like, you know, what's going on with everything. I feel like you have ideas. Are you, are you going to jump on it the same way you did last time? Or what's your, I guess, what's your approach to it this time around now? Like, you know, you know, a little bit. So I, and I'm sure 
again, I'm sure people would even disagree and think everything's all rosy. So what sure. what would be your take? I mean, is this is this something where you jump on it? If you see a big mean reversion, do you jump on it right away, or or, or how do you play it? You 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 have the experience from 2008. Yeah. Well, first and foremost, yeah, I'm I'm no longer engaged in managing other people's money. First. Yeah. So just you personally, Second, you just handle your own personal yes. money. And then my personal money, I don't, I don't really have any. I mean, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm, I'm sofa surfing on, on fr at friends' houses you're around the world. Um, why hey, you're welcome. Hey, you're welcome to come anytime, man. San Diego and L.A. I got you, bro. Anytime. Oh, I'm, com I'm coming. I like San Diego. Um, oh, is dude, San Diego is that, where, is that where uh, Coronado Island is? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, dude, there's a lot. San Diego is nice now. You know, like it used to be where everybody liked L.A. more. And now San Diego, just they're like it's L.A. without all of the the smog and crime. So, oh, please, anytime, well, they, I mean, man. I mean, you're just making me think of 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 more of these spiritual books. I mean, you know, the the thing I've gained an understanding the last twelve months is 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 the importance of impermanence. You know, we persuade ourselves that everything is permanent, everything's going to last. And again, think of what I said to you: the the UK rejected the gold standard. Like the gold standard was, we were it was thought to be permanent, and again back to this de-dollarization, um, it's very hard to conceive of a world that doesn't have this global dominance of, of the dollar perception of it. But you know, nothing is permanent; things will change, uh, and and therefore the question to people watching this is, how prepared are you for change? But to answer mm -hmm. your original question, I think what I'm doing is I'm. My risk capital today is my reputation, and I'm out there. I'm on this show, and you know, I write. Um, I write sporadically on Twitter. I don't. I can't write formulaically. You know, I'm not there, kind of trying to play with a, an algo and trying to get numbers. Yeah. I, when when things pass in here, I, I share with people, and you know, I've said, you know, I think this market's easy. I'd be I'd be long TLT, and I went on stocks. Amen. You know, Amen. So, um, if I'm wrong. You know, you you can pee on my reputation. You know. Well, let me ask you this: What do you think about the yen? So, like, let's say things go bust again. Well, do you think the yen will return to safe haven status? Because it was already wild that it even weakened how it did this last year and a half. But do you think people, yeah. if if the dollar got messed up or anything again, even if our banks had problems, do you think people would return back to the yen again, or is is that imp is that permanence of yen safe haven over now forever? Okay, so, um, you know, we have deflationary money. You said something about, well, I mean, if, if the banks kind of get a bit funky again, I mean, we have deflationary money. I mean, the, the banking system is 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 a tale that's really going to slap us all around, I think, in, in a manner that we saw similar to 2008. The question on the yen is, is, is a great question. The, the yen has been formidably strong and and when bad things have happened globally the yen has typically strengthened and there is a lot of perception as to why that is um and then and then we come in with this the impermanence of everything so nothing is guaranteed to last forever and we've had a a, a big challenge to the price charts to say I mean, the market's kind of saying mm, the yen could weaken and it could it could lose its status. The status is presently being questioned. And of course, there's I think there's a lot of silly talk about uh, their vulnerability uh, because they've been doing QE uh, for almost 30 <laughs> <Forever>. years. <laughs> um, but the, the, the charts do say something the the charts. Um, have a perception of change within them. I mean, the very, very long term. Again, we was I was what was I saying? Twenty and fifty month charts, if not two hundred month charts and stuff. They're they're all kind of markers are kind of going. Mm -hmm. um, I've kind of tried to rationalize that. Um, so I said QE. Um, I'm I believe QE QE is camouflage. It's a fluster buster. Yeah. It sounds good. And when no one really understands money, you can you can kind of say, I'm printing money, I'm doing QE. And I th think that's that's nonsense. I um, I keep trying to buy coffees in well, I don't really go to Starbucks, but in their kind of funkier equivalent. But they don't accept bank reserves. You know, they, they kick me out. I've got to I've got to <laughs> use my my Apple iPhone. Um 
Japan, however, has has had and maybe because it's had it longer, but what's been happening is that the there's a suspicion that Japanese huge uh, Japanese banks have been going into what we call the euro dollar market. The euro dollar market is simply a market which which exists outside the sovereignty of the United States, and where um, if you are if you can provide adequate uh, collateral, then another bank will print dollars will create dollars there's i think there's more dollars created I, I i know there's more dollars created outside the sovereignty of the united states rather than inside via domestic institutions uh, extending credit to to us uh, us citizens um, and what's happened in japan is again we talked about idolatry and and the japanese like everyone else came to believe that china just was dope that whatever <laughs> those communists are doing just like we thought with the Russians in the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, and the 70s, just like we thought of Brazil in the 70s, like this thing's going to last forever. I've just, I got to get skin in the game. And there is a suspicion that the Japanese wholesale banks were able to go to the, uh, the, the lending window, if you will. If we think of this little window where you, you go and say, hey, hi, and mm. you're like, hey, you know, if I give you this, will you give me dollars? And they're like, what you got? And they're like, well, we've got all these bank reserves. What if I gave you like a billion dollars of <laughs> Japanese bank reserves? That we print every what day. And they're like, yeah, and like, yeah I'll, I'll, I'll give you, you know, $500 billion. And you're like, wow, okay. But I'm only going to give you it overnight. And so you've got to go back each day, if you will. Um, but they take those dollars. And then they've gone into the Chinese financial markets. And again, despite all the nonsense you hear, um, China has a huge, immense need uh, for US dollars. Dollars are scarce uh, within the global banking system. It's why the dollar has risen by and large against everything else in the last 15 years. Um, and so the Japanese are taking this kind of bank reserves, they're getting dollars, and then they're they're taking credit and, and term risk to Chinese borrowers, and that's something that I I actually believe that is what we that is what we saw in the initial kind of where the, the yen suddenly just dropped and became very weak. I think it's more that than JGBs and the Bank of Japan's accumulation of JGBs. You know the Great Widowmaker trade. Uh -huh. I actually think it's that. Now that is still supp position it has not been demonstrated or confirmed um, by a very important indicator and that indicator would be the, the the cds price the cost of protecting the senior bonds of uh, japanese banks the the price of protection is mm, it's a little bit high but it's it's historically it's it's is blah that's uh, something i watch very closely that would um why would that be important? Because if I've lent these goons my dollars <laughs> and I've accepted their kind of collateral of bank reserves, and then I realize they've lent it to Chinese property companies and they've given them like 10 years to a lot of term risk, I start to get really worried that I'm not going to get my capital return. So, yeah, so I'm now hedging. worried about the, Yeah, and so, and so I'm hedging, so I'm buying protection against the viability of those institutions. Like I said, that message just now is split, but... Um, but I'm conscious of the time. But I, I, in terms of my funky mind, I am emotional. I am my. I'm reputationally very long. Uh, the the price performance of no, I'm, I'm very long. The price performance of U.S. Treasury ultra long bonds in an environment where everyone is screaming inflation. Yeah, okay. Um, and so I think the price is if my reputation escapes um, damage and if I'm validated, the price of those bonds will go shooting up, which is to say we will see a pretty severe and shocking economic global recession. I think the portents of that are everywhere. But and what I'm saying to you is if we had 2008, we had 2009 and the instigation of quantitative easing and the, the funny money and asset prices recovering, I can conceive of a world, I can conceive of a world where um, 
really bad things happen, which creates a further revolution in central banks where like Jay's, Jay will be kicked out. They'll get another person and he'll have even crazier ideas. <laughs> and, it, and so my, my thing is absurdity. I think the treasury bond market will, the bull market will, will one day end. And that day is within two or three years. And I think the colliery of that is the, to finally answer your question, the, the permanence of this very safe, very strong yen, I think that will wither, I think that will die. Uh, and I think the catalyst for both of those things is that we will have a severe and shocking um, recession or whatever term you apply to like that 2008 period. Um, and the aftermath or how they deal with that will ultimately um, create a create an, a, like a real devaluation in, in fiat and financial wow. assets. So is, I don't know, correct me if I'm wrong, so you're more so you think then US bonds would be a better safe haven than the yen currently. Um and I think I think actually that they will perform. I think they're 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 the same side of one coin. Yeah. Okay. You know, they're they're heads to to the tails of equities, let's yeah. say. All right, I could agree with that. And now let me ask you this cuz I know we've we've heard TLT a lot. And actually, I don't know if you know, so that's one thing that got us pretty big here on uh, with the Colt. In 2020, I made a video telling everybody to buy TLT right before Powell, uh, <laughs> right before he did that. So we were actually like, we bought we bought all the TLT options. It was like 30,000%. It was all, everybody on YouTube made a lot, and we, we, we love TLT. But let me ask you this. Why TLT? Why 20-year plus versus like IEF or 10-year bonds? So what do you think about the 10 year oh, versus big, 20? It's, it's just bigger bang for your buck. I mean, um, I, I'm, I'm talking um, to, I'm talking to the people listening to you. You know, I'm not talking yeah. to in the main, I'm not talking to him. If I was a hedge fund, I'd have a, an is there agreement, which is essentially, it's like, it's like having a drug dealer on on fast dial right you know, like, <laughs> i need to boom it happens right that's that's a, an isda agreement it's a it's a license to throw it's a it's a credit agreement where you just get unlimited leverage and so i could buy i could buy cash you know like you know the feds at five and i think they might be at zero right okay so why don't like you were asking me about 10 year why don't i own like two year you know um and and if I was a hedge fund, and indeed that's what I was doing in 2008, I was I was actually believing that the, the two-year rate would fall more sharply than the 10-year because there's term risk. There's mm -hmm. you know the, there's a lot of things that can happen beyond two years, um, but you need a NISTA agreement. You you need a counterparty that's giving you a ton of leverage in the real world where we are. I mean, I didn't. I'm in Malibu, so I'm not in the real world. Um, <laughs> I'm mostly in my head, which is not the real world. But, you know, the, the metaphor of the real world. Um, you don't have your bank giving you like a billion, a, a million dollars of, of, of notional leverage. OK, so let's say you've got $100,000. Um, and, and so you're, Delta, you're a Delta One investor. Well, you know, the if you're right, the, the ultra long the price performance will be leveraged it will it will it will give you more bang for your buck than the 10 year and it'll give you more bang for your buck than the two year okay so it's a it's it's a it's a duration we would say it's a duration uh, adjust adjusted thing so you want lots of duration you want lots of bang for your buck because you're limited by a lack of leverage all right i love it thank you I, I chad i hope you guys hear that when you're watching this i hope they i hope they make it this far for that that's beautiful. So now let me, I guess maybe, I don't know. I don't know how much time you have left here, even here too. Uh, but I could give you one more good question. We could sure, keep going. Go. We could do this forever too. I'm, I'm, I've been loving it so far. I really appreciate it. What do well, you we think? We can do it again, but let's do yeah. one more. Let's, 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 uh, we'll wrap it up with this easy one, but not so easy. <laughs> do you think the regional banking crisis and what we're getting now, do you think it's over? And or do you think it'll spread beyond what we've already seen? Um, it, it's, it's only just beginning, you know, um, the, the regional banks, I mean, every banker now is terrified. It's absolutely terrified. You know, the, you know, you're walking, I'm sitting here. It's as if I'm sitting here. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then boom, I just, I just <laughs> been punched in the face and I'm like, 
what was that? What did I do wrong? It's not obvious. Like I said to you, um, if we look at Credit Suisse, there was nothing wrong in its reg the regulated capture. All the things they insist on, everything was impeccable. And it died. Um, so Silicon Valley, um, were they naive and like incompetent managers? I think we can overdo that. That's like when you get angry and you start calling names. Mm -hmm. Again, you're investing with prejudice. Um, they were acutely vulnerable to a particular part of the economy, which was, you know, startups, tech startups. And, and we discovered they just got a lot of money, but they didn't actually have a lot of, uh, certainly in the short term, um, profitable investments to make. And so once they had spent the money, they just needed more money. And, and we stopped that because, you know, the Fed was pursuing deflationary money. So the bank boomed. But you know, we discovered that your bank deposits just disappear. You know, remember, a bank has is a weird construct because it has short term liabilities. You, your deposit, you, you just I mean, we thought you would kind of go to the bank. You would, you would, you would write out a, an instruction form, and then you say, "I want, I want to take my money." Right now, we realize you just get your phone. You go, "Boom!" Okay. <laughs> um, so you have these liabilities, which can be processed and transacted against you instantaneously, and against that, you don't have liquidity in the asset base. You know, the asset base is loans. Right, so if you get a run, you kind of got to go. You got to call in loans. You know, it's this complicated stuff. Um, or, or you, so you have loans to you know to real businesses, or you you lend to the government, and and you do that via uh, via investing in you know fixed income securities. Um, you try and hedge, but uh, your interest rate risk again. Remember, there's a big, you know, Silicon Valley were were you know idiots because you know, their hedging was either non-existent or or just poor. Um, again, the counter to that is Credit Suisse in its statement of the week preceding its bankruptcy said, we are fully hedged on interest rates. Okay, so, hmm. albeit, does that mean they were fully hedged on interest rates going going up? I mean, does it apply to interest rates going down? Because we, we don't we don't know the answer to that. But, you know, they were, they had, they had professional and they had substantial interest rates. Uh, interest rate protection on their book, they still went boom. Um, so banks, no one wants to be the next guy, and and they're they've got this precarious business of liabilities that can disappear immediately, and and assets which are really kind of hard uh, um, to 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 turn into cash, and they're caught in the middle. That that you know when when that equation goes wrong, your equity goes to zero and your your debt. So the risk appetite. For the banking sector, their willingness to, you know, you go, you chop on the window and like, hey, hi, I'm the asset capitalist. Can I borrow a million dollars? I'm like, get out of here. Like, come, okay. come back in a year's time when we figured this out. So, you know, the Fed's got the highest interest rates since Jesus Christ. <laughs> uh, the banks um, have got no interest in extending credit. Um, we kind of spent two years over ordering stuff with Amazon and Walmart and stuff. And now we're just trying to get rid of things. Even the biggest companies are laying off, you know, Microsoft, Google and all that stuff. They're laying off like 10, 15% of their workforce. And supposedly this is like the strongest economy ever. So, um, yeah, yeah, I can, I metaphorically, I feel like I can see dead people everywhere I look. So you think so, but I guess, would the timing of it be there? Because now, like you said, you know, ever nobody wants to be what's next. Do you think? It sounds like you think credit contraction will arise. They're not going to want to loan money. But then, like, I guess this fear of being next. Do you think it will stop them? It will stop the Fed. Oh, stop who? What do you mean? Say again. Well, either stop the Fed, or do you think it will get these banks to like, you know, really double down on making sure that they prevent any of this stuff for, stuff from happening. Yeah, it's, it's the latter. They're, 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 they're doubling down. They're taking strenuous efforts to protect themselves. And there's a kind of fallacy of composition that the stronger each bank seeks to make its own fiefdom, collectively, they make the system weaker. You know, the stronger you are, oh. which is a function of you're not extending credit, 
And then all of your competitors, they do the same. And so you're pulling credit out of the system, which is like me trying to speak without oxygen, which might be a good idea, might, might stop me speaking. But eventually I'm going to expire. I'm going to fall over because the system needs credit. So we've, we've now got precedent and we've incentivized banks to kind of rein in credit provision. And without credit provision, the economy withers very rapidly. You know, it, it, the, it, we, we, we go into recession. So fallacy of composition is always a major uh, uh, important uh, and overlooked uh, danger. That's where we are. Wow. I love it. I never thought about that. Make it to this as they try to get stronger, they weaken everything collectively. I love it. Yeah. I love it. Well, Hugh, I don't know. I think we could we'll touch base again on any of this, but I mean, I got I got like probably 10 more questions if every anything, but it's already it's been like what, an hour 15 so far? So Yeah, well, let's put this out and then you know, and then let's let's do a round 2. I, 